Today I want to finish uh, my series on parenting. I've been looking at uh, Joshua, what he said at the end of his life. He said some many amazing things. And one of the things he said is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we've been talking about some things that are just not true. And today we're going to talk a myth. It's an American myth. It's not found anywhere else in the world. And it's called, oh, she's a mommy's girl. It's not in the Bible. And it's something that is very dangerous to actually believe that. Are some, mo- are some daughters closer to mom and some daughters closer to dads? And are- Yes, that's true. But when you say she's a mommy's girl, what you're sometimes saying is it doesn't matter of her relationship with the father because there's very little impact or influence on it. Which is one of the reasons why this nation has such a high divorce rate and so many women are so confused and how do you choose a guy to marry? And so we're going to try to, you know, correct this myth today on Father's Day. So I'm teaching, I'm preaching and teaching today with my wife because I don't have a daughter. So some things you got to preach on faith. However, I will have two daughters when my boys get married. And I heard from some of the ladies in this church, I kind of like it. I don't have daughter-in-laws, I have daughters. I like that. I like that. So I'm going to adopt that. I think it came from an Italian, Francesca, so that's pretty good. Now, oh, she's a mommy's girl, it doesn't matter. That is a lie from the pit of hell. John 8 says Satan is a liar and the father of all lies. And when he speaks, he speaks from his resources. A daughter needs a relationship with a father or a spiritual father or an older brother that is a father figure because she doesn't have a father in some way. You with me? How else will she know who to marry? Most of the time, a woman marries someone with qualities of her dad or her older brother or maybe uh, an uncle or something like that. And so let's Let's debunk the myth that a daddy's influence on a little girl really isn't all that important, because it is important, and we're going to look at some scripture. So stand and change your positions, and then next week we're going to get into the book of Judges. We're going to talk about Samson. But Joshua says, I have given you, this is our good father, Joshua's 120 years old, he's about ready to die, and he tells all the people, like you fathers are supposed to do, remind your children children of the goodness of God, and that our God is not a only good, but he's a giver. What did he give them? I gave you land for which you did not labor. I gave you cities which you did not build, and you dwell in them. I gave you vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. Now... Therefore, fear the Lord, be grateful to God, and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the false gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Why? Because he's a good God. He's a good God. Why shouldn't you serve someone who's good? And if it seems evil to you because your thinking is messed up with the Lord, okay, go choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But Joshua said, but as for me and my house, say it with me, we will serve the Lord. Because of Joshua's fatherhood to the nation of Israel as a spiritual father, and because he reproduced himself and the elders of Israel from every tribe, Verse 31 of Joshua 24 says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. I mean, oh, that's a wonderful thing to say of a father. All the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all, let me put in there, the good works, the good works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, and I thank you for all the 
fathers that are here today, and Lord, I just want to encourage them. I'm not going to put any guilt on them. I want to encourage them and edify them. Help me to do that, Lord, to build them up. And Lord, to thank them for being here in the house of God on this special day. Holy Spirit, continue to work in our hearts. Keep our hearts soft. Don't let us get offended and harden our hearts over the many foolish things that the devil throws at us. But Lord, strengthen the shield of faith. We shall be able to quench every fiery dart of the evil one, especially these fathers, Lord. Bless them again for being here in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. In his book called Fathers and Daughters, Dr. William Appleton wrote this. For any woman, there is one positive dominating force in that woman's life, and it should be her father, not the mother. The father. Why? He goes on to say, because for that young little baby girl, her father would be the first man she meets. Her father would be the first man she gives her heart to. And her father, lastly, will strongly affect her future with men, depending upon her relationship with her father. Now listen, if you don't have a father today, that's okay, but listen to me. There's got to be a godly uncle or a cousin or um, an older brother or a spiritual father that you can draw what a man is, what a masculine man is, what a godly man is. Now, uh, a good father will leave a good imprint. See, I don't know what you think of when I say your father. Some people, they may be angry. Some may be happy. Some may be bitter. Uh, maybe some of their fathers were absent their whole life. That's a problem in the United States of America, absentee fathers. So if you have a father at home and you don't like him, suck it up. At least he's home. My goodness. Be grateful you have a father that's home. A lot of them have just taken off. You know, you know what Hollywood does against the men of this nation? They attack the men. They attack the fathers. You know, women's lib has gone 180 degree. They now are 180% against not just marriage, but children. Women's lib hate children today. It's just terrible. And you need to find what this Bible talks about, of what is a godly man. Not a perfect man. I'm not talking about a perfect man, but I'm talking about a godly man. So, listen, you want to have a father figure because it's going to set the stage in your life, especially I'm talking about girls. You can apply it to boys, but it's going to set the stage for her performance in life and her future spouse if she chooses to marry. Now, when you think of fathers as a young one, you think of, I have a daddy, Carvel ice cream. That's what daddies are for. And if you live on the other side of the town, Dairy Queen, all right, blizzards, okay? And if from old school, maybe Friendly's. Could be Dominic and Pia Pizza. Could be Mario's. But I mean, know fathers do more than just feed us. <laughs> They do a lot more than that. So we're going to talk about some things that uh, our Heavenly Father is and that we fathers are to be, and I'm commending the men that are here today. So let's get to the first thing. What, what is a father? What is our role? What makes a godly man? Well, number one, a father is a comforter because your daughters are going to have some things in this life that's going to rock their boat. It's going to shake them. It's going to be emotional. It's going to be adversity and storms. And the way a father grows in intimacy with his daughter is with comfort. In fact, the Bible says we grow with our Heavenly Father when we go through terrible seasons in life and we feel the mercies and the comfort of our Heavenly Father. Read this with me, would you please? Blessed be the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in our tribulation. 
A real, I'll say this one more time, a real bond comes between fathers and daughters when fathers take the time to comfort their daughters during a terrible season in their life. They need a man, listen to me, I'm going to speak straight up. They need a man who puts his arms around her and their non-sexual touches. That comes from the father. A daughter needs to know she can be loved, not just for her body. And it's a father or a father figure, an uncle or someone that, that can give them non-sexual touches and say, it's okay. We're going to get through this. Life throws rotten tomatoes sometimes, but we're going to get through this. And let's, let's just hold each other. We're going to get through that. Amen? Now, my wife has a great father. I have a wonderful father-in-law. And we're going to be talking a little bit about my father-in-law who's watching, Jim Letterman. And so at this time, my wife's going to share a little bit about what her father did when something rocked her world and how she was comforted. So, honey... Yep, that's yours. Let me turn it on. There you go. Good morning and happy Father's Day to all you dads. And for my dad who's watching at home, happy Father's Day, Dad. I talked to him on the way here, and I told him that I was going to be preaching, and I told him to tune in and listen because it was all about him, the good and the bad. So you're going to get it today. So, But one of the ways my father comforted me is I went through a broken engagement, and um, I was engaged to the youth pastor of the church that I grew up in, and the youth pastor was found out to be unfaithful. He had had relationships with multiple women that I found out afterwards in the church and a teenager, and it broke my heart, and I, my heart was broken, and the young man stayed into the church for a while, and I was brokenhearted, and I don't know if you've ever had a broken heart, but if you have a broken heart, sometimes it's hard to eat. You can't get it through your throat. Does anybody, can anybody relate to that? It was very difficult for me to eat. I wasn't sleeping. I lost a ton of weight, and my, we ended up having a fall harvest dinner, and um, my ex-fiance was at this dinner also, and they had a buffet line, and I was just really having a difficult time. Didn't want to go up in the buffet line because I wanted to avoid seeing him. I wanted to, um, I just wasn't feeling good like eating. I, I really didn't want to be there. It was very hard for me to go and be social. And um, so I was sitting with my mom and dad and just really struggling about going up, getting food. And my dad came and he held a whole plate of food, and he says, here, Cindy. And he put his arm around me, and he says, here, here's your food, so you don't have to go up. You can just stay here. He knew it was hard for me. And just that little bit of comfort, just that little act of service, that God used my dad to comfort me in a really difficult time by just doing something simple of getting me a plate of food that I could avoid any confrontation with my ex-fiance. And one of the things that I realized that that was only possible by the relationship that I had with my dad, he knew the turmoil. He saw what I was going through in my house, in our home, that I was having a difficult time. But my dad chose to just put his arm around me and comfort me and help me through it. I don't remember my dad ever saying any w words of wisdom through it. I can't remember. I'm sure he did. But it was just those simple acts of service that just showed me love and got me through it. And that was a father is a comforter. And my dad was a comforter. The second point is a father is to have understanding. Now, I will admit, and I'm sure a lot of women here have used it in their lifetime, how many of you ladies have ever said, you just don't understand me? Have we ever used it? You can raise your hands, because I know it, be truthful. Yeah, 
I see you. We've all have said it. We've said it to our husbands. We've said it to our fathers growing up. You just don't understand. And, you know, there are times when a teenage girl, she goes through, they say, a psychologist says that, what is it, age 13, that a teenage girl loses her mind, and so does the father. But the problem is, is the teenage girl gets her, her, her mind back, and the father has, I th always say, I think the father has to work on his. Do you think? Maybe? I don't know. But anyways, um, there are some fathers that just say, I will never understand her. I just don't get her. I will never understand her. And they wipe their hands of their daughter, and they don't have a relationship, and they miss out on a relationship of knowing their daughter and who she is, what she likes, what she doesn't like. And so I would say a father is to have understanding. And let's look at the scripture verse there. It says, he who restrains, Proverbs 17, 27 says, he who restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. All right? So dads, it's important to have a cool spirit. What does that mean? A cool spirit is somebody who's patient, holds his words, doesn't get mad, and to have so that you can understand what's going on, to listen. So um, Proverbs 17, 27 says that a cool spirit, well, how many of us, if we're honest, we've lost, we've lost our cool, and yeah, we've all done it, and that's okay. So I'm going to share a time where my dad lost his, and my mom lost their cool, okay? I will pay for this later, okay? So if you don't see me for a while, you know, I will pay for this. So anyways, when we were little, my brother and I have one brother, he's three years older. My brother is, um, we're like um, opposites. We're total opposites. He got the tall and thin gene. I got the little, I like to call myself little chunky gene, you know. I didn't get the, the same um, disciplines my brother has. My brother is very um, methodical. He's an engineer. So for those of you that know what an engineer is, he's very methodical. And I was very creative. And we were totally different. So every time we got into the back seat of the car to go on a trip, we argued so bad, like so bad. Like he was always in my space, what, you know, hogging the seed. And I'm sure I was very creative. And my brother would always get car sick, and that drove me nuts, okay, because I was stuck. In it. But we always argued. So anyways, we just pulled out of a trip, and we began to argue. My parents got so upset. Now, like I said, I want to put a disclaimer here. This is, this is a time where they lost it. This is probably, and you have to remember, it was 50 years ago, okay? So you have to remember, it was in a different time and probably not the best parenting skills, okay? But my parents lost their cool. They got so upset with my brother and I fighting, we drove, they drove us back home, took our suitcases out of the car, unlocked the house, put us in, and locked the house back up, and they took off. <laughs> okay, so you can just picture, I'm the younger one, okay? I'm the younger one, sobbing, crying. My older brother, it's okay, Cindy. We don't need them. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be just fine. We'll be just fine. My brother and I went upstairs. We unpacked both of our suitcases, put everything away. My brother made us lunch. Now, you have to know, my parents were just down the road. They were trying to put the fear of Jesus in us, okay? All right? They were trying to put a little fear in us. But meanwhile, my parents went just down the road for a cup of coffee. Meanwhile, my brother and I unpacked our suitcases, and we were eating lunch. When all of a sudden we can hear the front door opening, and they're back home. 
Well, what do you think they, do you think they were happy to know that not only we made a mess in the kitchen because we made ourselves lunch, and two, we unpacked our suitcases. So they had, think, so just picture, they had to repack us, clean up the kitchen, okay? So it was one of those things, they lost their cool. It went against the, the scripture of saying, a cool spirit, a man of understanding. All right, we've all been there, those kids fighting in the backseat. We went through it with our boys too. But one of the things is, it's kind of funny now when you can look at it 50 years later. And like I said, do not do this now. Totally different time in society. Yeah, look at, yeah, you will get arrested. Do not do that to your children now. So anyways, that was a time when my parents lost their cool. So again, like I said, I'm sorry, Mom and Dad. I had to, it's good, you gave me good material to share. So the first one is, a father is a comforter. The second one is, a father is to have understanding. The third point is, a father is for fun. And let's read the scripture verse underneath there. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart does good, like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Now, some of you fathers have to loosen up a little bit. Some of you, and I, I don't know who you are, I don't, hopefully it's nobody here, but some fathers are like a balloon, so full of air and so full of, the, they're not present in the house. They don't, they're no fun. They're not present at meal times. They're not present on vacation times. They're doing business on their phone when they should be with their kids. Some fathers are not present. Your kids wouldn't know that you had any ounce of fun in you, okay? Don't be like that. Be a father who's fun, who your kids want to be around. And my father, we always joke because we, we always say my father's not funny, but my father is hysterically funny, says these one-liners, nuggets, that one day I'm going to put a book of all the little one-liners that my dad says. Like, for example, you can't teach stupid, like my dad says that, or it will stop hurting when it stops hurting, you know, and or you feel better when it stops hurting or, you know, something like that. So my dad said all these funny things, but when I was a little girl, I loved to fish, had no idea that I knew it. And like I said, I had a brother, but he didn't, he didn't get the love for fishing like I did. So I was little. Um, I can't even tell you how old I was, but my dad actually, I was too little for a fishing pole, a, a real, like a kid's fishing pole. So my dad made me one out of a stick, and he tied a fishing line and a sinker and a hook he taught me how to bait my, my hook. I was not a sissy. I baited my hook, and yes, the worm pooped on my hands. Yep. Anybody who knows what it is, you guys are laughing. Do you remember? So I know some of you, it grosses you out, and that's fine. But I didn't like necessarily baiting my hook, but I did enjoy the whole concept of, of fishing and relaxing and you're, you're on the water with just your own mind. So anyways, my dad made me a fishing pole, and we were vacationing. I think it was in the Thousand Islands. And when we were um, out on the, our canoe, and we um, when it found a good fishing hole, he, you know, he knew how to find them. So anyways, picture this stick with a line on it. Like it's a, it was just a line with a with a hook and a sinker on it. To, and I would just plop it in the water and boom, I'd get a fish. And he was trying to put his, get his line baited and put it. So he would take my fish off the hook and put it in their little pail thing. And then I'd bait my hook and put it in the water. Boom, I'd get another one. I caught more fish this one day then my dad couldn't even get his, his baited, and he couldn't even fish because I was so busy catching them one after another. 
And we have to talk. But do you know what? Was it the fishing? No, it was the fun I had with my dad. And I'm so glad I have those memories that I had with my dad. And some of us can't change the dad that we had because we have different, we had um, different, uh, what do you say, uh, seasons of time where uh, most of the dads weren't taught to be present in their child's lives. They, they went to work, earned a paycheck, brought it home, ate, and that, that, they thought that was it. And, but it's important. Be fun. Be present in your kid's life. Another time I'll share with you, and, and I'll be honest with you, I failed the music test in middle school, okay? It was music theory, theory and I wasn't really interested. I didn't study. I failed the test. And the music teacher sent home the test and wanted my dad to sign it. So I brought it home fearing just the worst that I failed the test because my dad, if really, he, he really strived for us to have A's and I was really proud. I was a straight A student and you know, I don't know why I didn't study for the music test, I don't know. But anyways, I brought the test home with a failing grade and my dad showed it to him. He didn't say a word. He wrote a note on it gave it back to me, and so I read the note, and it says, I am so proud of my daughter's grade. She gets all her musical talent from me, and she did far above than I could ever do. <laughs> James Letterman signed it, and I had to take that back into my music teacher. That's fun. That's, I mean, that's a funny dad. That's, you know, my dad was present. He was funny. And I'm so grateful that he gave me all this material to share. So I'm now, I'm going to hand it back over to my husband. Thank you, honey. A father is a confidence builder. A father is to help their daughters and sons build confidence. Now mothers do that too, of course. But fathers are to help them become comfortable in their femininity, be confident, and uh, when a father rejects his daughter, um, it's going to come back with serious issues down the road. She's probably going to look for a man that's going to reject her, just like her dad, because most women, not all, follow in that steps of their father. So they need comfort, confidence, and accept, uh, acceptance. Now, I'm not saying if, you're, if your daughter's disrespectful to mom or if she's, you know, on drugs or immoral or something, you just let that slide and just comfort them and give them. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. But again, a father's impact on his daughter is second to none. And many times, we fathers, because we don't understand the opposite sex, it's a little bit harder to try to build confidence in them. And so what men do, and the Apostle Paul talked about this twice in Ephesians 5 and in Colossians, we get so impatient, we get mad and we provoke our kids. And that's why it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become what? Now, daughters will get discouraged a lot quicker than, you know, boys normally. And so we really have to be careful of that. Now, let me tell you a story with that, and it has to do with my father-in-law. My, my wife was young. She had an experience with uh, the Lord God, and the Lord said to her, one day you're going to be a pastor's wife. Well, she's probably eight years old, and she just felt the Lord spoke that to her, so she never let go of that. She held on to that. And she wanted to go to Bible school when she graduated from high school. But her father at the time was not a Christian, did not believe in Jesus. Her mother did, brought her and her brother to church, but her father did not. 
And so when she came time to graduate and I want to go to Bible school, her father said, no, you're not going. You got a sharp mind. I'm not wasting your mind on nonsense. Let's get you to a school. So she submitted to the authority of her father at that time. You want to know what godliness is? You want to know what Christ-likeness is? It's submitting to people in authority over you when you don't want to. Christ-likeness is not submitting when you want to. How many know Jesus did not want to be crucified? How many know he said, Lord, if there's another plan, (laughs) now's a good time to let me know? But a lot of people, because we live in such an anti-Christ America where they think they can rebel against anything and everything, it messes them up with the favor of God. So my wife said, when she was a girl, okay, Dad, I'll go to college like you want. If that's what you want, I'll submit to your authority. Because how many know just because your dad's not saved doesn't mean you don't have to submit to him because he's not saved. So two years later, she, I mean, she goes to college, she gets her uh, associate's degree, she gets a job at the New York District Assemblies of God as an administrative assistant in the youth department, she does really well. A couple years later, her dad gets saved, gets water baptized, starts becoming a disciple of Christ, and God begins to speak to Cindy's dad, and he realizes He should not have said that to his daughter. So he comes to her and he says, I want you to go to Bible school and your mother and I are going to help you. You need to quit your job, go to Bible school. She says, really? How many know God can work through situations you don't understand? God says, my ways are not your ways, neither are your thoughts my thoughts, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts and my ways and your ways, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. So she goes to Bible school, and if you don't know, my wife's a couple years older than me, and she showed up at Bible school at the same time I was in Bible school. And if she would have rebelled against her dad, She wouldn't be here today. (laughs) But you see how when you submit, God can still bless you when you don't like it. Now, I'm not talking about submitting to things that are wrong. I'm talking about submitting to things that you don't like, but they're not wrong. And that's exactly what she did. And uh, I'm so grateful that my father-in-law and my mother-in-law sent her to Bible school and They built her confidence. They did that. The next thing I want to tell you quickly is a father is a role model. A father figure is a role model. That uncle, whoever it is, very important. You've heard me say this before. You teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. You need to teach your children what is right and what is wrong, but then you got to live it. Because if you pretend to be something on a Sunday and you're something different from Monday to Saturday, your kids will see right through that. That is poor training. Yeah, you're teaching them, but you're not training them. So we need to train them. Daughters perceive how to be treated the way their dads treat them. You hear me? Daughters perceive how to be treated by men, by how someone they love and respect treats them. Most of the time, it's their father. It's the way a father treats the girl's mother. We always tell our boys, if you think you're close to marriage, take a look at that girlfriend and see how she treats her dad. Because if she treats him like junk, you're the next piece. (laughs) And it's the same, you know, uh, with girls. Uh, You know, um, see how he treats his mother. Because how he treats and loves his mother is how he's going to love you. Or the disrespect of mom is going to come right into the marriage. That's why Paul said this. 
For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. Be a role model, be an example. Not because we have authority or do not have authority, but we made ourselves a what? An example that you know how to follow us. Fathers aren't perfect. We're not perfect. But you need to know how to teach and train them. Now, I learned this. What do you teach your kids? Well, teach them the Word of God. Teach them the Word of God. Teach them the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, there's uh, seven W's that you can teach your kids that Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, taught them. First, wisdom. Second, wealth. Third, women. And if you marry the wrong women, you can kiss your wealth and wisdom goodbye. It's in that order. Wisdom, wealth, women. And of course, it's also, you know, it can be the wrong man too. Number four, after women, see if I get it right, work, the right work. Number five, words. The wisest man that ever lived said, guard your tongue. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it kills the spirit. The wicked say, let's lie in wait for blood, but the upright with wisdom shall be delivered. Where does the wisdom come from? The words. So wisdom, wealth, wisdom, work, words, wine. He has a lot to say about wine, alcohol, Beer is a brawler and wine is a... Let's talk to someone who doesn't know how to handle alcohol. And then what's the last one he talks about in Proverbs 31? The right wife. Proverbs 31 woman. That's what you teach your kids. But then you show them in the way that you love them. Amen? Very important that you do that. Very important. Okay, let's get to the last one and we're going to honor the fathers. Ready? Ready? A father, a father figure is going to affect their daughter's choice of a what? Many times, it'll be someone who has similar qualities of her dad. The worst thing a little girl can ever say is, I will never marry someone like my dad. You just cursed yourself. <laughs> because you will marry someone like your dad. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means we fathers should take very serious the way we bring up our daughters. Very important. God help us to examine ourselves. Paul said, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Make sure you do your best as living an example, not perfect. My wife, we had coffee this morning. She's, Paul, she says, you're, you're a great dad. And I said, well, thank you, honey, but... I only did the best I could. And I came up short. I came up short. But you know the great thing about a follower of Jesus Christ is when you come up short, you can always cry on for God's mercy and grace to make up the difference. Just say, God, you know. There, there are some times as a father, you know, I didn't know if one of my kids was going to die and I'd go to jail or... It, it's not easy. It's not easy. And I often wonder, why didn't God give me a daughter? But how many of you know you just can't worry about those things? When I'm mature enough, he'll give me some daughter-in-laws. <laughs> no parent is perfect, young people. We do our best. We do our best. And we try to be the best we can with that. Choose to be happy. Now, one of the things my father-in-law did, and I'll close with this, is that when he got saved, he began to honor the pastor's wife that at Christmas time, he'd go to her and says, I want to buy a dress for you for Christmas. I want you to go out and pick the dress that you want. Come back and tell me uh, how much it is, and then I'm going to write you a check, and I'm going to honor you that way. And uh, 
my wife, she just thought, well, that's amazing that my dad would just honor the pastor's wife and buy her a dress every Christmas. Isn't that neat? But thanks to you, Dad, she still wants me to buy her a Christmas dress because she's a pastor's wife. <laughs> I'm the pastor's wife now. Fork over the money. <laughs> but that was a good example, was it not? That's a good role model, is it not? And that's the best we can be, men, is just try to be the best role models that we can be. And when we fall short, we apologize. You know, we don't try to hide our mistakes, but we do our best. Don't believe the myth. Oh, she's a mommy's girl. Don't even try, fathers. No, don't believe that. You do your best to love your daughters and keep loving them even when they leave. Three stages of a daughter. The childhood stage where she falls in love with her father. The teenage stage or the conflict stage where her dad knows nothing. And then the college stage where she learns, well, maybe dad does know a couple things. Maybe. And fathers, I learned this from some men in my previous church. I thought it was very noble of them. But uh, some of my friends have uh, multiple girls and they would date their daughters once a year, all their daughters, and they would say, this is how you're to be treated on a date. This is how a man's supposed to open a door for you. And uh, this is what you got to decide. You got to decide, do you want to order for yourself or you want me to order for you? And you don't get dropped off in a honk or horn. You go, no, you take you to the door. And fathers, if you still have daughters, and date them. Date them. Solomon said this, if you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. Date your daughters. I'm talking about your single daughters, okay? Date them. Teach them what it is. You know, my wife took my boys out on a date. She would take them out on a date and say, this is how you're going to treat me. <laughs> and then hopefully, when you get married, you'll find someone like me and you'll treat them the way and they love, they love my wife. And so you want to not wait for perfect conditions. Do your best. They're not in the house long, are they? Not very long. Bow your heads with me, would you please? Father, we thank you that in the Godhead you decided that you wanted to expand your family and so you created Adam and Eve. And Lord, in that creation you expanded the human race. And there were no roles of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit before you created humanity. But Lord, you took on those roles so that we would have an idea what a father's supposed to be like, what a, what a son's supposed to be like, what a mother's supposed to be like, what a daughter's supposed to be like. We thank you, Lord, for that. And Lord, we want to honor the men today, the fathers that are here today, that have come here. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, the impact that they have is much greater than what they realize. And Lord, bless them, especially this day, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Thank you for listening to the teaching from the Word of God. My name is Paul Height. I'm the pastor of Evangelical Christian Church, located at 1325 Watertown Ave in Waterbury, Connecticut. We would love to have you join us and worship Jesus Christ this coming Sunday at 1030. Now may God bless you, and may he continue to cause you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of his Son, Jesus Christ.